Chapter 3 In the Underworld In the hush of a beautiful Sunday morning, the new missionary begins what she calls the commonplace work of the day. Looking out some illustrated text, she sends a few with a kindly message to all the big men, reminding them that Mr. Anderson expects them at service. Then she sets out for the town, and a few people escape her keen eye and persuasive words. "'Why are you not going to God's house?' she asks a man who is sitting at the door of his hut. Close by are the remains of a devil house. He rocks himself and replies, "'If your heart was vexed, would you go any place? Would you not rather sit at home and nurse your sorrow?' Mary learns that his only child has died, and has been buried in the house, and according to custom the family is sitting in filth, squalor, and drunkenness. She talks to him of the resurrection, and he becomes interested, and takes her into a room where the mother is sitting with bowed head over the grave, the form of which can be seen distinctly under a blue cloth that covers the ground. A bunch of dirty muslin is hanging from the ceiling. It is a dismal scene. She reads part of John 11 and speaks about life, and death, and the beyond. Well, remarked the man, if God took the child, I don't care so much, but to think that an enemy bewitched it? To the mother, she says, do you not find comfort in these words? No, is the sullen reply. Why should I find comfort when my child is gone? Mary pats her on the head and tells her how her own mother has found comfort in the thought of the reunion hereafter. The woman is touched and weeps, the mother heart is much the same all the world over. A few slave girls are all she finds in the next yard. The other inmates have gone to work at the farms, but she speaks to them and they listen respectfully. Another yard is crowded with women, some eating, some sleeping, some dressing each other's hair, some lounging on the ground gossiping. Her advent creates a welcome diversion, and they are willing to listen. It helps to pass the time. They take her into an inner yard where a fine-looking young woman is being fattened for her future husband. She flouts the message, and is spoken to sternly and left half crestfallen, half defiant. It is scenes like this which convince Mary that the women are the greatest problem in the mission field. She does not wonder that the men are as they are. If they are to be reached, more must be done for the women, and a prayer goes up that the church at home may realize the situation. Further on is a heathen house. The master is dead, the mistress is an old woman, hardened and repulsive, the embodiment of all that is evil, who is counting coppers in a room filled with bush, skulls, sacrifices, and charms. A number of half-starved, cowed women and girls, covered with dirt and sores, are quarreling over a pipe. The shrill voice and long arms of the mistress settle the matter and make them fly helter-skelter. They call on Mary to speak and after many interruptions, she subdues and controls them, and leaves them for a moment impressed. She arrives at a district where the lady agents have long worked. The women are clean, pleasant, and industrious, but polished hypocrites, always ready to protest with smooth tongue and honeyed words that they are eager to be godwomen, but never taking the first step forwards. Mary, who is learning to be sarcastic, on occasion gives them a bit of her mind, and goes away heartsick she is cheered at the next yard, where she has a large and attentive audience. In the poorest part, she comes upon a group of men selling rum. At the sight of the white maw, they put the stuff away and beg her to stay. They are quiet until she denounces the sale of the liquor. Then one interrupts. What for the white man bring them rum? Suppose them rum no be good? He be God men bring the rum. Then what for God men speak so? Which can she answer? It is a vile fluid, this trade spirit, yet the country is deluged with it, and it leaves behind it disaster and demoralization and ruined homes. Mary feels bitter against the civilized country that seek profit from the moral devastation of humanity. She cannot answer the man. A husband brings his woebegone wife who has lost five children. Can Ma not give her some medicine? She again speaks of the resurrection. A crowd gathers and listens breathlessly. When she says that even the twin children are safe with God, and that they will yet confront their murderers, the people start, shrug their shoulders, and with looks of terror slink one by one away. She visits many of the hovels, which are little better than ruins. Pools of filth send out pestilent odors. There is starvation in every pinched face, and misery in every sunken eye. 
Covered with sores, the inmates lie huddled together and clamor only for food. One old woman says, I have prayed and prayed till there is no breath left in me. God does not answer. He does not care. To whom do you pray? I don't know, but I call him God. I tell him I have no friend. I say, you see me. I am sick. I am hungry. I am good. I don't steal. I don't keep bread from anyone. I don't kill. I don't speak with my mouth when my heart is far away. Have mercy upon me. Mary talks to her lovingly and earnestly, and when she leaves, the heart of the wretched woman is quieted and grateful. It is afternoon, and time for the Ephic service at four o'clock, and Mary, a little tired with the heat and the strain, turns and makes for Mission Hill. Chapter 4. The Pull of Home it was not long before she had to revise her opinion of the climate. Nature was beautiful, but beneath its fair appearance lurked influences that were cruel and pitiless. Calabar needs a brave heart and a stout body, she wrote. Not that I have very much of the former, but I felt the need for it often when sick and lonely. Both the dry and rainy seasons had their drawbacks. But she especially disliked the former, which lasted from December to March, because of the smokes or harmattan, a haze composed of fine dust blown from the great African desert, that withered her up and sucked down all the energy she possessed. She was frequently attacked by fever and laid aside, and on one occasion was at the point of death. But she never lost her confidence in God. Once she thought she had. It was during an illness when she was only semi-conscious, but on recovering the clearness of her mind, she realized that she had given herself into his keeping and need not fear, and a sense of comfort and peace stole over her. So many attacks weakened her constitution and made her think oftener of home. She began to have a longing to look again upon loved faces, to have gray skies overhead, and to feel the tang of the clean, cool air on her cheek. I want my home and my mother, she confessed. It was homesickness and there's only one cure for that. It is not so overpowering after the first home-going, and it grows less important after each visit. One finds after a short absence that things in the old environment are, somehow, not the same. That there has ceased to be a niche which one can fill. That one has a fresh point of view. And as time goes on and the roots of life go deeper into the soil of the new country, the realization comes that it is in the homeland where one is homeless, and in the land of exile, where one is at home. But at first the pull of the old association is irresistible, and so when her furlough was due, Mary flew back to Scotland, as a wandered bird flies wing-weary back to its nest. She left Cowalabar in June 1879, and proceeded straight to Dundee. During her stay, she removed her mother and sisters to Downfield, a village on the outskirts of the city, and was happy in the knowledge that all was well with them, Friends who listened to her graphic account of Calabar tell that even when she spoke of her desire to go up country into the unworked fields, and especially to the Okeong district, but Daddy Anderson was opposed to the idea. Before returning, she wrote to the Foreign Mission Committee and begged to be sent to a station other than Duketown, though she loyally added that she would do whatever was thought best. She sailed with Reverend Hugh Goldie, one of the veteran pioneers of the mission, and Mrs. Goldie and on arrival at Calabar in October 1880, found her joy that she was to be in charge of Old Town, and that she was a real missionary at last. Chapter 5. At the Seat of Satan The first sight she saw on entering her new sphere was a human skull hung on a pole at the entrance of the city. In Old Town and the smaller stations of Kue, Akim, and Aikot Ensa, lying back in the tribal district of Ikoi, the people were amongst the most degraded in Calabar. It was a difficult field, but she entered upon it with zest. Although under the supervision of Duke Town, she was practically her own mistress, and could carry out her own ideas and methods. This was important for her, for to her chagrin, she had found that boarding was expensive in Calabar, and as she had to leave a large portion of her salary at home before the support of her mother and sisters, she could not afford to live as the other lady agents did. She had to economize in every direction, and took to subsisting wholly on native food. It was in this way she acquired those simple, Spartan-like habits which accompanied her through life. Her colleagues attributed her desire for isolation and native ways to natural inclination, not dreaming that there was a matter of compulsion, for she was too loyal to her home and too proud of spirit to reveal the reason for her action. 
One drawback of the situation was the dilapidated state of the house. It was built of wattle and mud, had a matte roof, and a whitewashed interior. She did not, however, mind this condition. She was so absorbed in the work that personal comfort was a matter of indifference to her. Her household consisted of a young woman and several boys and girls, with whose training she took endless pains, and who helped her and accompanied her to her meetings. Schoolwork made large drafts on her time at Old Town, Kue and Akim. Young and old came as scholars. At Kue, the chief man of the place, after the king, sat on a bench with little children, and along with them repeated the Sunday school lessons. He set them an example, for he was never absent. But to preach the love of Christ was her passion. With every visitor who called to give compliments, with every passerby who came out of curiosity to see what the white woman and her house was like, with all who brought a dispute to settle, she had to talk about the Savior of the world. Sunday was a day of special effort in this direction. She would set out early for Kue, where two boys, carrying a bell slung on a pole, summoned the people to service. One of the chiefs would fix the benches and arrange the audience, which usually numbered from 80 to 100. She would go on to a kim, or a kat anza, where a similar meeting was held. On the way, she would visit sick folk, or call in at farms, having friendly conversation with master and dependents, and giving a brief address and prayer. By midday, she would be back at Old Town, where she conducted a large Sunday school. In the evening, a regular church service was held, attended by almost the entire community. This, to her, was the meeting of the week. It took place in the yard of the chief. At one side stood a table covered with a white cloth, on which were a primitive light and a Bible. The darkness, the rows of dusky faces just revealed by the flickering light, the strained attention, the visible emotion made by a strange picture. At the end came hearty good nights, and she would be escorted home by a procession of lantern bearers. Such service, incessant and loving, began to tell. The behavior of the people improved. The god of the town was banished. Chiefs went the length of saying that their laws and customs were clearly at variance with God's fashions. Mr. Anderson reported to the church at home that she was doing it nobly. When two deputies went out and inspected the mission in 1881-82, they were much impressed by her energy and devotion. Her labors are manifold, they stated, but she sustains them cheerfully. She enjoys the unreserved friendship and confidence of the people, and has much influence over them. This they attributed partly to the singular ease with which she spoke the language. Learning that she preferred her present manner of life to being associated with another white person they were unaware, like others, of the re reason which governed her, they recommended that she should be allowed to continue her solitary course. It was at Old Town that she first came into close contact with the more sinister aspects of mission work, and obtained that training and experience in dealing with the natives and native problems which led her into the larger responsibilities of the future. Despite the influence of the missionaries and the British Council, many of the worst heathen iniquities were being practiced. A short time previously, the Council had made a strong effort to get the chiefs to enforce the laws regarding twin murder, human sacrifice, the stripping and flogging of women by Igbo runners, and other offenses. An agreement had been reached, but no treaty. No Igbo proclamation could root out the customs of centuries, and they continued to be followed in secret in the towns, and openly in the country districts. The evil of twin murder had a terrible fascination for her. A woman who gave birth to twins was regarded with horror. The belief was that the father of one of the infants was an evil spirit, and that the mother had been guilty of a great sin. One at least of her children was believed to be a monster, and as they were never seen by outsiders or allowed to live, no one could disprove the fact. They were seized, their backs were broken, and they were crushed into a calabash, or water pot, and taken out, not by the doorway, but by a hole broken in the back wall, which was at once built up, and thrown into the bush, where they were left to be eaten by insects and wild beasts. Sometimes they would be placed alive into the pots. As for the mother, she was driven outside the bounds of decent society, and compelled to live alone in the bush. In such circumstances, there was only one thing for the missionaries to do. As soon as twins were born, they sought to obtain possession of them, and gave them the security and care of the mission house. Some of the mission compounds were alive with babies. It was no use taking the mothers along with them. She believed she must be accursed, for otherwise she would never be in such a position. 
First one and then the other child would die, and she would make her escape and fly to the bush. Mary realized that the system was the outcome of superstition and fear. And she could even see how, from the native point of view, it was essential for the safety of the house. But her heart was hot against it. Nothing indeed aroused her so fiercely as the senseless cruelty of putting these innocent babes to death. And she joined the campaign with fearless energy. She could also understand why the natives threw away infants whose slave mother died. No slave had time to bring up another woman's child. If she did undertake the task, it would only be hers during childhood. After that, it became the property of the master. The chances of a slave child surviving were not good enough for a free woman to try the experiment, and as life in any case was of little value, it was considered best that the infant should be put out of the way. The need of special service in these directions made her suggest to the Foreign Mission Committee that one of the women agents should be set apart to take care of the children that were rescued. It was impossible, she said, for one to do school or other work and to attend to them as well. If such a crowd of twins should come to her, as I have to manage, she would require to devote her whole time to them. More and more also, she was convinced of the necessity of women's work among women in the farming districts and she pressed the matter upon the committee. She was in line with the old chief who remarked that them women be the best man for the mission. Another evil which violated her sense of justice and right and against which she took up arms was the trade attitude of the Calabar people. Although they had settled on the coast only by the grace of the Ecois, they endeavored to monopolize all dealings with the Europeans and prevent the inland tribes from doing business direct with the factories. Often the upriver men would make their way stealthily, but if caught, they were slain or mutilated, and a bitter vendetta would ensue. She recognized that it would only be by the tribes coming to know and respect each other, and by the adoption of unrestricted trade with the stores, that the full reward of industry could be secured. She accordingly took up the cause of the inland tribes. When Ifik was at war with Kue, sentries were posted on all the paths of the factories, but the people came to her by night, and she would lead them down the track, running through the mission property. At the factory next to the mission beach, they would gather their palm oil kernels, and take back the goods for which they had bartered them. In this way, she helped to open up the country. It was not perhaps mission work of the ordinary sense, any more than much of Dr. Livingston's work was missionary work. But it was an effort to break down the conditions that perpetuated wrong and dispeace, and introduce the forces of righteousness and goodwill. In all this work, she had the sympathy of the traders, who showed her much kindness. She was a missionary, after their own heart.